Hi, I'm Dr. Jack West, medical oncologist and president and CEO of the Global Resource for Advancing Cancer Education, or GRACE. A transcript as well as a PDF file with copies of figures associated with this program are available at www.cancergrace.org forward slash gracecasts. I'm here today with Dr. Eric Valliere, a thoracic surgeon who is the surgical director of the Lung Cancer Program at Swedish Cancer Institute in Seattle, and he's also among the worldwide leaders in the concept of integrating chemotherapy and other systemic whole body therapies with the surgical approach for early stage patients. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Jack. Turning to the business of surgery for lung cancer, who's most commonly doing it? Are more patients with lung cancer undergoing surgery by a specifically trained thoracic surgeon, by a cardiothoracic surgeon, or even by a general surgeon? Uh, And does it matter? Well, the answer to that varies depending on the country and even in the United States on the region. And there has been a gradual shift into having lung cancer surgery being done by non-cardiac thoracic surgeons. Individuals who are trained in thoracic surgery don't do heart surgery, but their focus is on the non-cardiac aspect of thoracic surgery. Now, certain regions, the majority of the lung cancer work is still being done by general surgeons who have had an interest with lung cancer, but they also do other cancers, and they are general surgeons. Certain places, uh, cardiac surgeons or cardiothoracic surgeons, individuals who will do both cardiac surgery and lung cancer surgery will be the dominant players. So I don't think you can put a stamp across the nation and say this is the way it's being done. As far as the quality of the work, that's very debated right now. And there are more and more reports coming out that seem to indicate that if individuals who have a dedicated career in non-cardiac thoracic surgeons probably offer the best results, not only on the early results, meaning complications around the time of surgery, but also long-term cancer survival appears to be better done. That's a very debated hot topic, but there's a growing literature on that indicating that indeed, and it makes sense, and it's been shown in other lines of cancer work that uh, centers who do high volume or individuals who do high volume tend to have better results. One of the surgical procedures that you perform is a mediastinoscopy. Can you tell us what that is, what that entails for the patient, and how it's used in staging a patient potentially for surgery? So mediastinoscopy is a procedure that's exactly 50 years old this year. It was first described by a Swedish, not from the Swedish Cancer Institute, but Sweden, from the Karolinska Institute in 1959, an otolaryngologist by the name of Dr. Carlins. And this procedure has been used for 50 years as a surgical means of biopsying and accessing superior mediastinal lymph nodes. These are lymph nodes that are located in the mediastinum, which is the compartment in between the two lungs, where the major airway sits, the esophagus sits, but also all the lymph nodes that drain both lungs kind of meet in that area. It's similar to what the axillary lymph nodes are to breast cancer in lung cancer. Okay, so that's usually one of the first areas where a lung cancer that escapes the lung will land into. And the significance of these nodes being involved or not is that we have known now for quite a long time that once those lymph nodes are involved, the role of surgery is diminished enormously. And that the role of surgery for patients who have lymph node involvement in their superior mediastinum, for some is very questionable, for others is possible, but usually combining things with other treatments. The reason why the role of surgery is minimized is because if the nodes are involved, statistically, there's a high chance that there may also be metastases elsewhere in the body. And that's the reason why, for most patients, surgery alone does not help them. And we've known that for a long time. So for many, the status of these lymph nodes is a key factor in determining, is this a patient that should go to surgery first, or is this someone that should not have surgery at all, or is this someone that should have surgery as part of a combined approach where there will be also be some chemo and radiation therapy involved in their treatment. So that has been historically the way of doing this. For the patients, this is a day procedure. You don't have to stay in the hospital after you've had that done. It's done under an anesthetic, general anesthetic, so you're asleep. It's a small incision, about uh, two centimeters, maybe an inch wide at the base of the neck. And this way we can access the superior mediastinum, which is behind the breastplate. 
And we do that with a hollow instrument that has a light at the end, and we can find those lymph nodes and biopsy them, give them to the pathologist, who then will analyze and see whether the lymph nodes are normal or involved with cancer. That has been and still is the gold standard way of assessing lymph nodes in the mediastinum. Is mediastinoscopy widely available? It should be widely available. A lot of surgeons who are not high-volume lung cancer surgeons still fear that operation, and they just don't do it because they don't feel comfortable doing it. But that, I think, should be less and less of an issue. Today, we do video mediastinoscopy. It's the same instrument, but instead of looking down a little keyhole, you now have a big picture on the TV screen, which makes it, in my opinion, a lot safer. You can see things a lot better. That operation should be available. Now, if you're in the middle of nowhere and there's not a high-volume thoracic surgeon 200 miles away from where you live, you may not find someone in your area that's going to have access to this operation. But in 2009, most places you'll find there should be someone close by who can offer you this operation. I think I'd heard also that in the U.S. at least, an enormous proportion of the population lives within an hour of a board-certified thoracic surgeon. Board-certified cardiothoracic surgeon, that is right. Now, a lot of these individuals are predominantly cardiac surgeons and may not be as comfortable in doing mediastinoscopy. But you're right. An hour driving across this country, you can find a certified cardiothoracic surgeon. Whether or not that individual has maintained an expertise in lung cancer work or whether that individual has done mainly cardiac surgery over the years, that may be different. Over the last decade, we've seen PET scans become universally incorporated into staging for potentially early-stage non-small cell lung cancer. Does PET scanning obviate the need for mediastinoscopies in some or many patients? I think it does in a proportion of patients. And for some surgeons, that proportion is larger than others, debated in meetings constantly. I think the one thing we've learned with PET scan over the last 10 years is it's not perfect. It'll miss the fact that sometimes some lymph nodes are involved, and also it will tell you that lymph nodes are involved when they're not involved. So I think over the last 10 years, this test that when it came out was supposed to be perfect for lymph node evaluation, we realize is not. Now, statistically, if you have a small little cancer way out at the periphery of the lung that's not very PET active, and if your lymph nodes are totally normal on PET scan, the odds that you would find something at mediastinoscopy are really, really low. However, if you have a tumor that's more central or larger or quite hot on PET scan, even if the lymph nodes are negative on your PET scan, statistically, there is now a higher risk that your lymph node may still be involved, and these are the patients where we still mandate mediastinoscopy. Another technique that is just starting to become more widely available is endobronchial ultrasound, or EBUS. Could this less invasive technique serve as a substitute for mediastinoscopy? I think EBUS is a great technology. I think it will replace mediastinoscopy in certain scenarios and situations. However, right now the literature on EBUS is very limited, as mainly comes out of three centers in the world. And whether or not the test is going to be as accurate and as good as it's been reported from these three centers once everyone starts doing it remains to be seen. However, it's less invasive than mediastinoscopy. There's no incision involved. So it's a bronchoscopy, basically, with a special tool. If EBUS biopsies a node and that node is positive, then you have your information. But if clinically you suspect that the lymph nodes are involved and you do an EBUS, and the nodes are negative, you need to do a mediastinoscopy to confirm, indeed, that the EBUS was right. So if clinically you suspect that the nodes are involved and the EBUS is negative, these patients still need to have mediastinoscopy assessment. So right now, it's a complement to exactly where that test will fit in the algorithm of working up patients with lung cancer remains to be seen. And I think that before a center adopts a rigid strategy with the use of EBUS and mediastinoscopy, they need to interrogate their own data and see how good are they in sorting out things by this test. It may be that eventually it'll replace the majority of the mediastinoscopies that we do, and it may not, but we need to see more data. Besides the things we've mentioned, what does the rest of a preoperative workup for a lung cancer patient involve? Well, the first 
as a complement to what we've talked about, we've talked about the PET scan, we've talked about mediastinal staging by EBUS or mediastinoscopy. Basically, in the first question is, should these patients be offered surgery? And that's what these tests are asking. There are patients in whom you also want to take a look at their brain before surgery because PET scan does not look at the brain. And there is definitely a group of patients, predominantly patients with adenocarcinoma histology of significant size, that may have clinically silent brain metastases. So I think the role of brain imaging has to be individualized in asymptomatic patients. And that's a test that we order often in patients that we believe are at high risk, even though the PET scan looks good. That aside, the other category of testing that we need to do on those patients is assess whether or not they are fit enough, whether or not they have enough cardiac and pulmonary reserves to undergo losing part of their lung to the surgeon. So that's done mainly with pulmonary function tests or exercise testing where we measure individuals' lung capacities and flows and volumes, and we have an idea of how safe it is to take these individuals through surgery and how much lung we can remove for them to not only survive surgery, but to have a good quality of life, breathing life beyond surgery. A lot of the patients have smoked for many years. That's what led them to have their lung cancer. Well, that also puts their heart at risk of having coronary disease. Now, someone who is not very active may not be challenging their heart the way we would be challenging their heart at the time of surgery. So in those patients, we may want to also put them through some cardiac stress tests before surgery. But these are the main areas. You want to make sure they have enough cardiac and pulmonary reserves to withstand the amount of surgery that we think they deserve. As far as the stress of surgery, someone who's going to lose a portion of the lung versus a whole lung, that's a day and night as far as the amount of stress this is on the patient's early recovery and long-term life as well. So we need to take a good look at these patients as well. So part of the assessment for the lung cancer surgeon is also to address up front, how much lung do I think I'm going to have to remove for this individual? And that's not always precise, but that's part of the art. One of the big changes in the last few years in the lung cancer surgery field is the increasing use of video-assisted thoracoscopic surgery, or VATS. What do we know about the differences in outcomes as well as side effects for the less invasive VATS approach compared with an open thoracotomy? Well, VATS has certainly increased in its use And VATS today is not what VATS was 10 years ago. The instrumentation's better. I think we've learned from our previous experiences, and we are doing a better job now than we're doing 10 years ago. VATS is less of an invasive operation, and if you don't spread the rib cage very much to do surgery, they hurt less. So VATS is a definite advantage in the early recovery period particularly for individuals who are kind of frail and would not tolerate too much pain for too long, I think that is a major advantage. On the long run, two, three weeks, four weeks later, the advantage of VATS versus open surgery are probably not as important, probably not there, basically. One of the things that's happened as a result of the VATS phenomena over the last 10 years as well is that We're not doing the same thoracotomy we were doing 10 years ago. It's not as morbid as it used to be. We don't spread the ribs as much. Why? Because we have instrumentation now that from VATS that allow us to do open surgery less hurtingly. So I think we also have to be careful when we compare the results of VATS today to thoracotomies done 10, 15 years ago. That's apples and oranges because we're not doing the same thoracotomy we were doing 10, 15 years ago. I was trained to remove a piece of the rib in every case. We don't do that anymore. The recovery from a thoracotomy is still, for many patients, hard, a lengthy process. And there may be some advantages here in using VATS in individuals who you think may benefit from getting some other treatment after surgery, chemotherapy for that matter. And one of the issues about giving chemotherapy after surgery for many years after a thoracotomy has been a lot of our patients are just not ready or they don't want it. They're just still recovering by the time you're talking to them about chemotherapy. Well, there is some early data that suggests that maybe people that recover from VATS surgery would be more inclined, more ready to get chemotherapy after surgery. We've got to be careful here. That's one institution, one set of data. It makes sense. It's a good argument, but I think we're still early on this. One little caveat about VATS, however, is not everyone who does VATS lung cancer surgery replicates the operation that they would do if it was open surgery. 
And that's one of the dangers of minimally invasive surgery is you kind of cut the corners to be able to do it that way. And if you do, don't do it. You should do by VATS the exact same operation you would do if you were doing open thoracotomy. Otherwise, you shouldn't be doing it. Some people have also asked about robotic lung surgery. Does that offer any clear advantage over a more conventional VATS or thoracotomy? No, there's no evidence at this stage of the game with the robotic technology that we have that it doesn't seem to be offering big advantages over the VATS approach. The truth is we're still using some of the VATS instrumentation and staplers when we're doing robotic surgery. So it really hasn't caught on yet. But the technology is changing, and there may be, in the very near future, a place for robotics to take over VATS and all open surgery as well. In the thoracic cavity, we are a little disadvantaged in that we cannot inflate the thoracic cavity and make it bigger and give us room to work with these instruments. We're in a rigid cavity. We can't make it bigger like they do in the abdomen, for example. So that may have slowed down how fast we've adopted these technologies in comparing to the belly surgeons. But we're getting there, and the technology is better, and we may go there. Robotics remains to be seen. Can you tell us about the differences among the different types of lung surgery, such as a lobectomy, a pneumonectomy, a segmentectomy, and a wedge resection? Well, in order, the smallest amount of lung that you take out is a wedge resection, and then the next larger amount is a segmentectomy, and then a lobectomy, and then on the right side, a bilobectomy, and then a pneumonectomy. Pneumonectomy means the whole lung is coming out. Lobectomies are the standard, and that's based on data that's about 25 years old now, but which has shown at least in the population of patients we operated on 25 years ago, that a lobectomy was a superior operation than a segmentectomy or a wedge resection. After four or five years of follow-up, lobectomy patients deemed better. Less cancer came back, their survival was better. So lobectomy is a standard. There are three lobes on the right, two on the left. So these are the five lobectomies that you can do. Not every tumor is amenable to a lobectomy. If a tumor is straddling two lobes, then both lobes may have to go on the left side. That means the whole lung has to go. The lung is like a tree. So if you have a little tumor at the end of the branch, you just take out that branch, you're okay. The same little tumor is near the main trunk, then the whole tree may have to go. So sometimes it's not just the size of the lesion that dictates how much lung you remove, but where it's at in the tree. A wedge resection, which is the littlest amount of lung that you remove, is basically like taking a piece in the pie, just usually a V-shape or U-shape where you don't follow any anatomical lines and you just take out the tumor with a rim of hopefully uninvolved lung around it and you take out the cancer. It is the surgery that is probably easiest for the patients to recover from. It is also the one where there's littlest amount of lung removed, so should have least impact on the breathing beyond surgery, but it is a compromised cancer surgery. A segmentectomy, which is the next one up the line, is more of an anatomical removal of the tumor and the segment of lung in which it's in. Each lobe has a determined number of segments. The right upper lobe, for example, has three segments. Well, if you have a small tumor in one of the segments, maybe taking out just one segment instead of the whole lobe can provide good cancer care. So you take out a little more lung than you would in a wedge, but less than you would in a lobectomy. In general, in a healthy young individual, each segment contributes about 5% of their breathing capacity. That's kind of the rule. So if you take a segment instead of a whole lobe, uh, comparing to the right upper lobe, you're taking out 5% of their breathing versus 15%. So that may be a compromised operation for patients who have cannot afford to lose too much lung. It may also be a very good operation, however, for little tumors. Little tumors that we see today in 2009 that we were not seeing 25 years ago because imaging was not as good. And 25 years ago, when they compared a lobectomy to segment or wedges, majority of the tumors that were in that study were more than two centimeters in size. 
Today, we're often asked to do surgery on someone that has a cancer that's a centimeter or even less in size. And there is a question that maybe a segmentectomy for those individuals is a very good cancer operation, but we don't have the data to support that yet. In fact, there is an ongoing North American trial, which is trying to answer this question, where patients with little tumors, less than two centimeters in size, with the tumor is well located to allow segmentectomy, where we're going to, again, compare segmentectomy to lobectomy for the little tumors. Repeat the study that was done 25 years ago, but with smaller tumors. So segmentectomy, I don't think, is that bad of an operation for the right patients. The standard of care in 2009, however, remains a lobectomy, as long as all the cancer can be removed that way. In Asia, they have a lot of patients who are found to have small bronchioloalveolar carcinomas, or BACs, that often have a very good prognosis and rarely involve lymph nodes or distant spread. And there's a greater use of smaller surgeries like wedge resections and segmentectomies. It seems to me that they're kind of leading the movement toward that. Would you consider that an appropriate approach? Or if somebody came back from Asia with a sublobectomy surgery, would you recommend a completion lobectomy? I think we have to be careful. First of all, the lung cancer that they see in mainly Japan, that's where most of that data is from, is not the same lung cancer that we see here. It may look the same under the microscope, but we're understanding more and more that biologically these are different malignancies. The typical well-differentiated bronchioloalveolar carcinoma that you allude to, we do see here in North America, but not as frequently as they see it out there. So the number of patients that we see here that could potentially benefit from these lesser surgeries purely based on the good, favorable histology, we're just not seeing as many as they are. The majority of the patients that we see here, that we operate here, that have a bronchioloalveolar carcinoma to their malignancy also have an invasive adenocarcinoma as part of that disease. That's not what these surgeons in Japan are operating on by doing wedges. They're operating on pure BACs, and we see some here, but they're not that common. So I think that if someone had gone to Japan and had a pure BAC and had been treated that way, I'd be fine. I wouldn't reoperate on them. In fact, the few patients that we've seen here, this is an approach we've also considered, but we see very few patients who have the, there's a pathologist in Japan called Noguchi who's studied that, and he's put five groups, and the groups A and B are the ones you describe. They don't spread. There's no node involvement, and these are the patients that you can get away by doing less surgery. But once you're a C, D, or an E, these patients have nodal disease, and that you need to do more surgery. What we see in North America tends to be more of the C, D, and E variety. The median age for a new diagnosis of lung cancer in the United States today is a little over 70. What are some of the particular challenges of lung surgery in older patients, and do you approach them differently? Well, it's not really their chronological age that determines how we do things. It's more their physiological age. If you have an 85-year-old gentleman who skis three times a week, that patient, you look at him the way you would a 60-year-old, okay? Similarly, you have 60-year-olds who've had a tough life, and they come to you, and they look more like 80. So I think age alone is not the factor. It's more their physiological age. But the older folks tend to have more comorbidities. They may have some heart issues. They may have some kidney problems. They may have other health issues, which by themselves are not contraindication to lung surgery. But in the recovery from their lung surgery, we've got to be careful because they don't have a lot of reserves sometimes. But age alone is not a contraindication. It's more the physiological package that you have to look at. Some people have noted chronic pain in the region of their prior chest surgery. Is there any good background information about the so-called post-thoraconomy syndrome and its incidence and how frequently it's severe? Yeah, I look at that data and I'm going, I think we need to relook at this. I'm not sure that we see 15 to 20 percent of our patients with chronic pain more than two months beyond surgery. I think there are patients that will have, uh, and the incidence may be around 10, 15 percent or less, of patients who have chronic pain months beyond their surgery, even possibly years. Most of that is probably due to damage to the intercostal nerves, which is a nerve that runs under each rib. Probably has to do a lot with rib spreading. 
or even with VAT surgery, you'll have in some series 10% of patients who have chronic pain, no rib spreading, but you're having these rigid instruments that you're working in between tight ribs and you damage the nerve as well. That's what the nature of that pain is. It's nerve damage to the intercostal nerve. I think the incidence is a lot less than it used to be, mainly for the reasons I've said earlier. We don't do the same thoracotomy we were doing 10, 15 years ago. One of the common complications that you're asked to help manage in lung cancer as well as other cancer patients is a pleural effusion. Can you tell us what that is and why cancer patients get them? Well, pleural effusion is an abnormal accumulation of fluid inside the chest, outside the lung. The lung is sitting in a bag called a pleural sac, which normally is empty. There is fluid that traverses that sac every day, but what comes in goes out. And there are many pathological processes where that balance of what goes in, what comes out, is disturbed and fluid starts accumulating in the bag. And because the cavity, the chest cavity is rigid, it means it accumulates inside and the lungs get squished. And that's how these people present. Their lung is squished or they're short of breath or they have pressure in their chest or they're coughing because their lung cannot expand fully and so on. So that's what pleural effusion is. In cancer, one of the ways that lung cancer will present itself is by pleural effusion, by having fluid around their lung, usually due to the fact that the cancer has spread to the lining of the lung or of the rib cage, which in the presence of cancer in that membrane disturbs that balance, what goes in, what comes out. So now fluid starts accumulating inside. The presence of a pleural effusion in association with a lung cancer that otherwise appears to be operable is a serious issue and needs to be worked up to make sure that there's no other reason for that fluid to be there besides cancer. Because if it's cancerous, surgery is out of the question. But if it's not cancerous, maybe surgery can still be offered. And there has been some work done in Japan mostly looking at surgery after treatment, say, for a pleural effusion that has not looked favorable enough to be adopted routinely. Correct. There's a very little literature on that. There's a surgeon in Japan. There's also a group at the Brigham in Boston that looked at this. And obviously, the surgery is a lot bigger of an operation. Not only do you have to remove the whole lung, but you have to remove all the lining where those cancer cells were before. And that's called an extra pleural pneumonectomy. And the uh, results from that, both from the Boston experience and the Japanese experience, is that very, very few patients benefit from that approach. So in general, if you've had a pleural effusion involved with cancer, whatever your response to therapy may have been, surgery is not in the books. What are the leading options for managing a recurrent pleural effusion? There's two scenarios. If you have a pleural effusion that is asymptomatic, patient is otherwise managing quite well, you can leave it alone. Because as far as surgeons are concerned, and intervention in a pulmonologist, What we treat is not the effusion. We treat the symptoms of the patient. It's a palliative intervention when we tackle effusions. So someone has symptoms. The first question to ask is if you take out the fluid, does the symptom go away? Because there may be patients, they have a large effusion, they're short of breath. You take out all the fluid, they're still short of breath. It's not worth chasing the effusion. So a patient, large effusion, symptoms, you drain the effusion, symptoms go away. The next question is, does the lung re-expand? If the lung re-expands significantly, then there are things that you can do to try to sclerose or glue, if you want, the lung against the ribs so that the fluid can't come back. And that's called sclerosis or pleurodesis. And we can use talcum powder, betadine, hypertonic glucose. There are solutions that can be used. But that only will work if the lung re-expands. Another option is not to try to sclerose them with chemicals, but use a Plurex catheter, which is kind of a newish device. It's a catheter that comes out of the skin, a soft catheter, very comfortable, doesn't bother patients very much. And what happens is that every day or two, patients hook their catheter to a vacuumed bottle and they drain themselves at home of that effusion. Any procedure, anything that we do for these folks, however, is a palliative procedure is to try to prevent the fluid from coming back so that these symptoms don't come back. That's it. That's the only role that we can play for these individuals. 
Has there been much of a problem with infections with the Plurex catheters? Not really, actually. And it's not a technology that's unique to Plurex catheters. That technology has been used for a long time for peritoneal dialysis catheters and other lines where there's a cuff. It's a tunneled catheter. It doesn't go straight into the chest. There's a long tunnel, a skin, subcutaneous tunnel, and there's a cuff around the catheter. And for some reason, infection is not being a big issue. Eric, thanks very much for taking the time to speak with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Jack.